Hello and welcome, I'm your CodeMonkey. I've been making videos on this channel for over 4 years now, I've covered tons and tons of topics in over 500 videos. One thing that I always made sure to do since the very beginning is read through all of the comments every single day and answer as many questions as I can. Usually I reply directly to the person, but if at least one person has a question, then chances are there's more people wondering the same thing. So here let's see some interesting questions that I saw that maybe you would also like to know the answer to. If you find this format useful, go ahead and hit the like button. I've already answered probably a thousand questions, so if you find this helpful, I've got many more questions that I can highlight in future videos. If you like using Discord, check out the United Programming channel. Lots of like-minded game developers helping each other out, asking and answering questions, getting some feedback and sharing their progress. So if you like Discord, check out the link in the description. And let's begin with a question that is relatively common among beginners. This one was posted on the video where I talked about what I managed to learn in Blender in just 10 hours, although the question isn't really related to the video. The question comes from Kian who asks, what are the necessary things to making a MMORPG game? Now this is very much a beginner kind of question. What I mean by that is that beginners tend to think in massive terms, like how to make an entire MMORPG or some like how to build Skyrim or Call of Duty. If you try to think in those terms, then you really won't be able to build anything. No one can go from zero to MMORPG. And by that, I don't mean in terms of programming skills, I mean that in terms of project structure. You cannot build a game by thinking of the final massive complete project. The way you build a project, really any project, whether it be small or huge, the way you do that is by breaking it into its core components and then doing one thing at a time. So if you want to make a game like Skyrim, first of all, I would definitely advise you to massively cut your scope, but still, assuming you really want to build a game just like Skyrim, what you start by doing is breaking that massive project into its core components, so first of all, you probably need some kind of player controller, you need to decide on first person or third person. Then you need to make some world where the player can walk on, perhaps build it with some kind of terrain system. Then you also probably need some kind of combat system, figure out how to build an enemy, how to add attacks to the player, and how to make those attacks damage the enemies. Each of those things involves tons of individual systems. Then perhaps figure out how to make an inventory, how to handle picking up loot, maybe handling equipment, then interact with NPCs, create a quest system, and so on. So instead of just thinking, I want to make Skyrim, start off by enlisting all of the components and work on them one by one. And back to this original question, if you think making Skyrim sounds way too easy, one way to increase the difficulty tenfold is just make it multiplayer. So needless to say, definitely don't do that if you're still in the beginner stage or even if you don't have a team. And also on this topic, let me just say that I'm no different. It's pretty much guaranteed that when someone first gets into game development, they're going to try building their dream game or something massive. I myself did the exact same thing. After making about 4 or 5 flash games, meaning they were really tiny games with basically just one mechanic, so they were really just prototypes. After doing that, I suddenly decided why don't I try making a massive MMO game all about cops and robbers. The idea was some players could play as the robbers and try to do some heists, and other players would be cops and try to stop the robbers. As you might have guessed, I never ended up completing that project. I worked on it for maybe 1 or 2 months before I realized that I had nowhere near the skills required to bring that vision to life. So my advice to you, if you tend to think in terms of massive projects just like this comment, first of all, lower your scope, so cut it in half, do that, then cut it in half again, and maybe by then you will have something that you can build. And the second thing is learn how to break a game idea down into its core components, and then work on each one individually, instead of just looking at the total project as a single task. This next question comes from my YouTube membership video, click the join button below if you'd like to get access to this video. This question is related to my grid building system video. That one is a really great system, it's built upon my original grid system which I started building many years ago and kept improving on it. The building system lets you define some buildings then place them on the grid, kind of like a city builder. To keep the video simple, I made the buildings always have a rectangular shape, so they have a certain width and length but never any weird shapes. So for the question over here, Hubbard Games asks, how exactly would I go about implementing some L-shaped buildings? So how do you add some buildings to this system without being rectangular buildings? My answer to that is, instead of just defining an int for the width and an int for the height, instead of that, define some kind of 2D ball array. Also, just in case you don't know about multidimensional arrays, in c -sharp you can create a regular array with square brackets, just like I'm sure you know about, but perhaps you might not know that by adding a comma inside, you can define various dimensions. You can have as many dimensions as you want. So for this case, making a 2D, a two-dimensional ball array is perfect. You can define the array for the building shape and then simply set it to true on the positions where you want the building to occupy and then false on the others. Then in the building logic where you actually place the building on the grid, for that instead of just checking for the standard width and length, 
Instead of that, you cycle through the array, check each individual bone position. If it's true, make sure the grid is empty on that position. If it's false, just skip it. I also did something somewhat similar to this in the Minecraft crafting video. In there, each recipe has a certain shape that it must conform to, and I use pretty much the same type of logic. Define a 2D array, and then for that case, define what items must go on each position to make a full recipe. So you could apply this to the grid building system to make buildings with all kinds of weird shapes. Or another fun system that I made, which is similar, is the inventory tether system. You could do the exact same thing in that one to make items with some weird shapes. This next question is a pretty simple one all about sprites. On the video for how to make a minimap in 60 seconds, the way I taught that is by adding a simple sprite on top of all of your objects. Those are sprites used for simple minimap icons, which are always pointing up. Then add a second camera placed above looking down. Then those minimap sprites are on a special layer that is not visible by the main camera and only visible by the minimap camera. And finally, the minimap camera renders the view onto a texture which is shown in the UI. So this system is based upon adding simple sprite icons to each object that you want to track in the minimap. And the question comes from Evan who asks, how do you create a 2D sprite if you don't see a 2D sprite option? Now, if you right click on the hierarchy, you may or may not see the 2D sprite option. If you don't, then the solution is actually super simple. You just go into the package manager and you install the 2D sprite package. This adds those sprite options and also enables you to edit sprites. So if you create a new project using an empty 3D template that does not have sprites by default, you can easily solve that just by installing the package. Also, alternatively, if you don't want to do that, you can just use a simple quad instead. The only negative to that is that you also need to create a new material, whereas with a sprite, you can just use the sprite directly. This next question comes from my turn-based strategy course. It's from the lecture on handling the unit selected visuals. To keep the logic and the UI visuals nicely separated, this is handled through an event. So the logic code doesn't care if there's a UI element at all. It works perfectly fine without it. If you don't know about C-sharp events, they are super powerful at helping you write better, more decoupled code. In there, I use a regular event with the event handler type for when the selected unit changes. And this question comes from Rob, who asks, since the events work with any delegate type, why use the event handler instead of the much simpler action delegate? And my response to that is that the reason is simply because it's the C-sharp standard. Events do work with any delegate type, so you can use it with action or with event handler, but like I said, event handler is the generally accepted C-sharp standard, and senders can be useful in helping you communicate with others. If you use common senders, then you can easily pass your code around, and other programmers will be able to easily understand your code. However, also, just in case you're working completely alone, you can also deviate from the common standards and use whatever standards make most sense to you. So in this case, if you're working with others, then I would encourage you to stick with the standard and use event handler. But if you're working solo, then feel free to use action if you prefer it, since it does simplify the event quite a bit. And sort of a second question inside this question, which is why use event at all, the event keyword. You can subscribe or unsubscribe to a regular delegate field. However, the event keyword serves to add some more limitations, which can help you protect your code from yourself. If you don't add the event keyword, then any class that can subscribe to that delegate, they can also call the delegate, they can set it to null or do anything they want. Whereas if you add the event keyword, then outside classes can only subscribe or unsubscribe and nothing else. So adding the event keyword protects your film and makes it so it is used exactly as intended. Other classes can sub or unsub, but only the main class where the event is defined, only that one can call the event or clear it. Again, if you want to learn more about C-sharp events, check out my full video on them. And if you want to learn how to write better code and manage a complex project, then check out my turn-based strategy course. All right, so those are a bunch more of your questions and my answers to those. I hope you learned something new. This is a new format that I'm trying out. If you like this format, hit the like button and let me know in the comments. Since I've been answering questions like this for the past four years, I have hundreds or thousands of interesting questions that I could include in videos like this one. And like I said, if just one person has a question, chances are some of you might also be wondering the same thing, so these answers might be useful. So do let me know if you'd like to see some more like this. All right, hope that's useful. Check out these videos to learn some more. Thanks to these awesome Patreon supporters for making these videos possible. Thank you for watching and I'll see you next time.